Before insulin was discovered, the treatment for diabetes was at very low carbohydrate type because it was the only thing that would keep people alive. And it, it's in all the textbooks, all the medical textbooks, and it got written out. As soon as the insulin arrived, then they said, well, we can treat you with insulin. And they didn't realize that that actually makes it worse. It doesn't make it better. Hey guys, today the legend stops by. He is Professor Tim Knox. Professor Knox is one of the world's foremost experts on low carb and has been in the forefront of revolutionizing current international dietary guidelines. Professor Knox has published more than 750 scientific books and articles. In fact, his book, Lore of Learning, is considered the bible of the running sport itself. Professor Knox has been cited more than 19,000 times in scientific literature, has an H-index of 71 and has been rated an A1 scientist by the National Research Foundation of South Africa for a second five-year term. He has also been ranked third in sports science globally and first in sports scientists. Professor Knox has won numerous awards over the years and made himself available on many editorial boards. Professor Knox has worked exceptionally hard to try to bring the truth to the scientific and broader community and we should be very grateful to him. I am very honored to invite Professor Tim Knox to the show. Thanks Professor for coming to the show. My pleasure, thank you so much and I love your enthusiasm and I know what good work you're doing in, in Hyderabad and throughout India. That's fantastic and any help I can offer, I'm only too keen to help. Thank you so much Professor Knox. Knox, uh, before we go into the questions, can you share where can people connect with you? Yeah, probably through my foundation, the Noakes Foundation. That's probably the best place. So just check on the internet and Noakes Foundation and you'll find all the details. Thank you so much, Professor Knox. Uh, Professor Knox, my first question is, uh, it takes a lot of courage to admit that we are wrong. So what made you to change your mind regarding carbohydrates? So I think you know my story. You mentioned my book, Law of Running, and that promoted a high carbohydrate diet. And I researched carbohydrates for 20 or 30 years and was convinced that carbohydrates were healthy. Then I discovered that I'd eaten this high carbohydrate diet and it made me unhealthy. And I developed type 2 diabetes. And I then discovered the solution. I read Eric Westman's book, The New Atkins for the New You. And that convinced me that I should at least try this dietary change. And I did, and the results were dramatic. Then I realized that the diet had caused me, the high carbohydrate diet had caused me to develop type 2 diabetes. My dad died of diabetes, so I had the genes. And even though I'd run all these marathons, I ran 70 marathons or ultra marathons in my life, all that exercise didn't prevent me from getting type 2 diabetes. However, the diet reversed my diabetes. And then I realized that I'd written this book that was widely read and I was causing diabetes in many athletes. And I had, I had the choice. Either you say you're wrong and, and help those athletes or continue to pres prescribe this wrong diet. And I'm, I couldn't do it. It was clear to me that I had to promote the, the change. I never realized that I'd get such a strong backlash, including, as you know, I was essentially thrown out of my university as a renegade, which is, which is quite something when you worked in a university for close to 35 years or so. But anyway, it's, uh, it's been a good experience and I've learned a great deal. And uh, I'm glad it, in fact, in the end, I'm glad it happened. Thank you, Professor Knox. Uh, my next question is, um, what is your opinion on a balanced diet? <laughs> You know, what's so funny is that if you ask anyone, what's, what's a balanced diet? That's not a scientific term. And everyone eats a balanced diet. I mean, I'm, we're all good people, so we do the right thing. So we eat a balanced diet. And then if you ask someone what's in moderation, that means that you don't have to change. Because I will tell you that whatever I do, if, I, if I'm an alcoholic and drinking two bottles of whatever a day, I'll say that's moderation because I don't want to change. And that's the reality is what happened. So people, as long as you, as you, long as you use the words in moderation, that means I don't have to change. And so there's, the, the, what is in moderation? The problem wa was that I thought I was eating a diet in moderation, but it caused me to develop type two diabetes because my body cannot cope with carbohydrates. So in moderation doesn't work for me. 
You know, I think what I've learned over the years is that there are two types of humans. The one are the people who fatten easily, and I'm one of them. And then there are people who don't fatten easily, and they stay thin all their lives, whatever they do, if they don't run or they exercise, and they can eat what they like. Now, when that person, and for many doctors and dietitians are like that, they thin, and they think they're very righteous. The reason I'm thin is because I don't overeat and I do lots of exercise. And they look over at us and they say, you see, Noakes' problem, he's fat because he's lazy and gluttonous. And that's not true. I got fat because I was eating the wrong foods. And, and, and I think this gets back to the question of moderation. If you are a fat and easily person, you cannot eat any carbohydrates. You've just got to cut them down. And the difference between, well, most, I'm sure most Indians are probably eating 300, 400 grams of carbs a day. And you've got to get down to like well under 100 to have a benefit. But even for many people, 100 is not good enough. But you can still be just as fat. You've got to get down to 25 grams a day, which is what I'm at. And so my moderation for a diet is 25 grams of carbohydrate, not 26, not 27, 25. <laughs> that's, and that's what people have to understand. Thank you, Professor Knox. Uh, Professor, uh, my next question is, uh, what are some myths perpetuated by sports drink industry? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one is that you have to drink as much as is tolerable in order to save your life. If you don't drink enough, you'll get heat stroke, you get dehydrated, you get heat stroke. And that is absolute nonsense. And I spent, I wrote the book Waterlog, which completely destroys that idea. In fact, if you drink as much as tolerable, you can kill yourself. You can develop this condition, exercise associated hyponatremia, where your blood sodium levels fall, your brain swells, you lose consciousness. And if the doctors don't know what they're doing, they give you more fluids intravenously because you're dehydrated and they kill you. And, and we predicted that would happen from our work in the 1990s, and exactly that, that has happened. There have been deaths, or at least 20 deaths reported in runners who overdrank during exercise and then were inappropriately treated by their doctors. So that, that's the biggest myth. Is the key is you must just drink to thirst. Thank you, Professor Knox. Next question is, how can so many experts on health are totally wrong? <laughs> They're totally wrong because the, the paradigm is fixed and you taught that from the, in the medical school from the day one or dietetic schools. And the, the bottom line is that the medical education is controlled by the pharmaceutical industry. That's it. And until one understands that, you can't get away with it. Say, so if I'm a professor of medicine, let's say I'm the dean of the faculty of my university of medicine. If I were tomorrow to say, we're going to teach this, that diet, diets are the most important determinant of health, I will destroy my faculty because I will get no more funding from the pharmaceutical industry. So I have to decide, am I honest? And say, listen, guys, you've got to read the literature and know that bad diet's killing us. And then that's going to kill the faculty. I'm never going to be able to train another medical doctor or I just do continue saying the same stuff. And people choose to do the same stuff. That's the problem. Thank you, Professor Knox. My next question is, why the present treatment for type 2 diabetes is not effective? Well, it's not effective because the problem in type 2 diabetes is you're completely resistant to carbohydrates. And every time you eat carbohydrates, you secrete insulin, and that then activates storage of fat in the key organs, and that causes insulin resistance, and it just makes everything worse. And then ultimately, your body's profoundly inflamed. And the only way to stop that inflammation is to take no carbohydrates. Taking the doctor's medicines and the insulin doesn't help because it's not treating the cause. You have to treat the cause, and that's excessive carbohydrates in the diet. And we've known that since, since the 1920s. The, before insulin was discovered, the treatment for diabetes was a very low-carbohydrate diet because it was the only thing that would keep people alive. And it, it's in all the textbooks, all the medical textbooks, and it got written out. As soon as insulin arrived, then they said, well, we can treat you with insulin. And they didn't realize that that actually makes it worse. It doesn't make it better. So, and then the industry is involved. In, so insulin is such a big, massive source of income for the industry that they can't stop. And if I'm professor of endocrinology at my university, I have to promote insulin. If I, for one moment, stop promoting insulin, no more funding, and my department collapses, and my 
ability to teach goes away. So that's the problem. There's a complete, the pharmaceutical industry has the medical profession completely in a vice, a vice-like grip. Thank you, Professor Knox. Uh, Professor, how to tackle intellectual harassment? <laughs> um, you, you take it, you go straight for it. You punch it on the nose and, and attack it. <laughs> you can't afford to, to ignore it. So I was harassed and I just, I fought back by going to court. Otherwise, I would have, destroyed, would have destroyed my life. I would not be a smiling, happy person today if I hadn't gone to court and proved my case. And of course, it was very difficult and I, I got severely stressed and I got a bit of post-traumatic stress disorder. And even today, when I talk about it, I, there, there'll be a feeling I don't, I don't want to go back on that topic. But, but you just have to fight it and, and you have to fight the truth. You know, that when, when my chief lawyers, we sat down and discussed what were we going to do, the guy said, you're just going to flood them with facts. That's all. You're just going to destroy them with facts. That's, and they, they didn't understand that. The opposition, dietitians and doctors, came with one paper, one scientific paper. And it was flawed anyway, which we proved. And we had 6,000, probably seven or 8,000 pages of evidence. And in the end, it was just overwhelming. And so, but, but I knew that we would win if we, if we presented the truth. As long as the system was reasonably balanced and fair, we would win. And, and that's what it is. So the, you've got to fight with what your tools are. And the, and the truth is, is the ultimate. It's the ultimate supporter thank you so much uh, professor Knox. you're awesome we know that um uh, professor uh, many people think that chronic illness are like a common phenomenon so they accept it what do you think about that absolutely see we've normalized the terrible diet that we eat this highly processed foods that's been normalized and obesity has been normalized so now i fortunately grew up in and i matriculated in 1966 and every child in my class was lean. And all the women or girls around us were lean, absolutely lean. And if you go back and look at the movies from the late 60s, and particularly Woodstock, if you go and see all the people at Woodstock because they're not wearing shirts, most of them, you'll see they're all lean. They weren't exercising. They weren't running marathons. They weren't going to the gym. But they weren't eating sugar and Coca-Cola and all those things and chips. They were eating a much more better balanced diet. <laughs> Sorry, better balanced <laughs> a diet of real foods. We were our parents cooked for us. Our mothers cooked for us, and they and they cooked real foods that not this rubbish that you go and buy at the supermarket. Thank you, Professor Knox. Uh, Professor Knox, many health experts suggest that uh, we are all unique, so we should eat different diets. <laughs> what do you say about that? Well, that's really interesting because it's thought that now 80% of people in North America have got metabolic syndrome and are insulin resistant. So yes, there might be 20% or 10 or 20% who are able to eat whatever food they like. But the, those of us that fatten easily is the insulin resistant. That we're by far the majority. And there's a study. Sorry. There's a study in Cape Town, in my town where they looked at pre-diabetes in a population of about a thousand people taken randomly off the street. And all of them were pre-diabetic, 100% were pre-diabetic. And this is, and it's astonishing that, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Professor Knox. Uh, Professor Knox, how to come out of carbohydrate addiction? Yeah, that's a great question because it's very difficult. And I think it's the under-recognized problem. The, and you have to get rid of the sugar firstly, and that means all processed foods because they're full of sugar. So you have to get rid of them and then slowly take the carbohydrates out as well. And I think that for most people, you have to actually go through a course to get rid of the addiction to sugar. It's, it's such a difficult problem. And, and most people who refuse to adopt this diet, yes, I think that's the problem. They, they look at it and they say, gosh, I can't do away with my sugar or my alcohol. Those are the two issues. And, so, and then bread, of course, the bread is the third one. Maybe not so much in India, but certainly in the West, bread is a key driver. And so they, they refuse to drop those three and they say, I can't do it. And so then they, it's hopeless. And what we found in a study of pa patients with type 2 diabetes who reversed on this diet, they reversed their disease, 
the ones who benefited and succeeded were the ones who got rid of their food addictions. And they said, I no longer worry about what I eat. I just eat these healthy foods. I have no cravings. So until you get rid of your cravings, you won't reverse your diabetes or your obesity. Yeah, I get criticized. I said that uh, obesity is a disease of hunger. And that's the truth. You see, if you ask a patient, what is the single symptom that every patient with obesity has? It's hunger. And I spoke to a guy who lost 400 pounds, 400 pounds. <laughs> and he said, I said to him, tell me what your life was like. He said, I was perpetually hungry. I would eat a huge meal and with half an hour, I would be rather starving again. That, now, until you speak to people and ask them, you don't realize. So that's the addiction that you we're talking about. And, it, and how difficult is that to get rid of? Well, addictions are terribly difficult. And only about 5% of people ever get rid of an addiction. So, so that's what we're up against. And, and until people realize that the foods we're eating are driving the addiction and they're designed to drive that addiction, it's very difficult to, to help people. So, Professor Knox, do you have any experience with India? So, you know, I have such a high regard for Indian people. You know, that's because um, I came with the South African team to India during the World Cup in 1996. And we came to India and the people were so good to us. It was astonishing. I mean, we were just treated so well. Point one, point two is if you go to my trial and read about it, you'll see that my chief defender was Dr. Ravin Rocky Ramdas, a South African Indian. And we are like this. We are brothers. And he's taught me about the Hindu religion and Ganesh. Uh, he told me about Ganesh and he, whenever we were in trouble, he'd say, Ganesh will look after us. <laughs> but but the, the funniest thing was that as a medical doctor and a lawyer, he is an astonishing man. I mean, he's just, just one of the great people I've met. He, he was first a doctor, then he trained as a lawyer. Whilst he was practicing medicine, he taught himself to be a lawyer. That's how clever he is. So anyway, <laughs> he would cross-examine me. He said, okay, Tim, I'm going to show you what cross-examination is like. <laughs> and within five minutes, I couldn't say a word. I was completely tied up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, and there's one other little piece of story. Yeah, that sure. In Kenai, I... The, I had two visitors from Chennai who came to South Africa. They wanted to build a sports medicine unit in Chennai. And we helped them and they built this fabulous facility in Chennai. And so I became very close to them as well. And then I was eventually asked to come and speak in Chennai. And I spoke and I made one error. And I was asked, who's the greatest cricketer of all time? And I said, Donald Bradman. And that didn't go down very well. <laughs> that was before Virat Kohli's time, but Sachin Tendulkar, I, I think I nearly got shot and murdered and sent home for not, not saying Sachin Tendulkar. <laughs> This is the best part of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Can you talk about central governor theory? Yes. So when I started exercise physiology in the 1970s, The idea was that when you exercise, you get tired because you run out of oxygen provided to the muscles. There's not enough blood to get to the muscles. They become anaerobic, too little oxygen, and they produce lactic acid, and the lactic acid poisons the muscles. And we did many experiments early on, and we were looking for, I'm always interested in the mechanism. So if you say that's true, then I must look at the mechanism. And we couldn't find evidence that the muscles went anaerobic. And we couldn't find evidence that lactic acid caused the muscles to stop working. So eventually, like in the middle of the night one night, I saw the truth. <laughs> and, and I saw the truth was that the brain was regulating the system. And the, it regulates to make sure you don't damage your health. That's why you have a brain. It's there to protect you. <laughs> and so I came up with this model where the brain is the driver. The brain makes you exercise. To move faster, you have to recruit more muscle. So the brain recruits the muscles. And that then allows you to exercise. And the muscles send information back to the brain and tell you whether it's okay what you're doing or it's not such a good idea. So, for example, when you go out in the heat, you immediately exercise slow, more slowly. The brain already recognizes it's too hot. 
I mean, you're going to get heat stroke if you exercise too hardly, hard. The same if you don't drink during exercise. We spoke about this drinking. If you become thirsty, ultimately you will stop exercising. So if you take people and you say, put them in the desert and say, okay, you keep walking. They don't die of dehydration. They stop long before they die. And then they become immobilized. And until they get water, they're immobilized and they can't move. And But the, replacing the water then corrects the problem because it's the brain is there and it, and you could exercise, but but the brain says, no, you can't. It's too dangerous for you to carry on. So that's the central governor model in a simple terms. And why it's important is because it tells you that exercise, your brain is very important. And what you're thinking is critical, absolutely critical. And I must tell you that that I'm the reason, one of the reasons why the Indian team or Indian won a gold medal in the Olympics two or three uh, two or three Olympics ago. And we worked with the shotist who shoots at 20 meters. And we showed him that when he fired at the target, he wasn't thinking and he wasn't even looking at the target. His brain wasn't working. He just knew that he was in the right position to shoot the ball. And it came down to the final shot in the finals. So he, he was ranked eighth at the start of the Olympics. He got into the finals and it, there were three guys tied and they had one shot left and his final shot was perfect and the other two shots were off. So the, the final came down to the one shot. There were three guys all tied exactly the score and they measured to the millimeter. You know, if you're out of a millimeter, that's minus one. He shot a perfect shot and the other two guys were off by a millimeter and so he won the gold medal. <laughs> but, but we taught him to that he had to, he couldn't think when he was shooting he had not to think because if he was thinking then you can't you don't concentrate and you don't get the information but the the other key point was that he knew when the when the shot would go would go through the ball he knew it didn't have to look he just knew from the training that he's in the right position it's astonishing that's awesome <laughs> that's awesome to hear <laughs> professor knox thank you so much uh, professor knox now we have questions from subscribers Yes. So, so first question is maybe your favorite question are complex carbohydrates healthier? No, because they're all broken down to glucose in the end and they all cause insulin secretion. So it's true that if you have a really complex carbohydrate, which has got a lot of fiber with it, you slow, you slightly slower digestion and your insulin resistance re release is slightly less, but ultimately if you carbohydrate resistance, all the carbohydrates have to go. Thank you, Professor Knox. Next question is, how should we as doctors must apply this knowledge in our practice and also how to deal with criticism that arises from that? Yeah, the criticism is based on the pharmaceutical model and the fact that, that you're only allowed to teach one thing at medical schools. So if you take my case, what was really interesting, I questioned, which is what universities are meant to do. And I got thrown out for questioning the dogma. If the universities were honest, they would say, you're absolutely correct. You must question. But they didn't. They, they threw me out. And that's the problem. That's the way education has gone. So you have to realize. But, but at the end of the day, it's only the truth that matters. And it's helping your patients. So you have to realize that the evidence is so strong that, and I'm going to emphasize this, it is now unethical. It is unethical for a medical doctor to prescribe a carbohydrate-laden diet for a person with type 2 diabetes. It's absolutely unethical. He sh the person should be in jail for prescribing that diet. But it's going to take a long time before that happens. But for the patient, you just have to know that, that, that you've got to get the right information, and the information is right there. And as I said, it's unethical. It's unethical to prescribe a low-fat diet as well. Because low-fat diets we know cause harm. And therefore, doctors are meant to do things that don't cause harm. First, do no harm. That's the rule in medicine. Thank you so much, Professor Knox. Next question. Does low-carb diets damage our organs? No. There's absolutely no evidence for that. The, the damage is made by the inflammation that comes from having a high-carbohydrate diet producing insulin resistance and then the metabolic syndrome. And there's a whole 
cascade of events that happens once you become insulin resistant. And that makes your body inflamed. And, and we see that with the COVID-19, that if you're obese and you've got visceral obesity, the, the, the virus, your response to the virus is amplified and you get this cytokine storm, which is an inflammatory storm, and that kills you. The virus doesn't kill you. It's the way you respond to the virus and you this, this inflammatory response. And the inflammation is already there if you're obese and you're diabetic and you're eating a high carbohydrate diet. And that's what's the problem. So you, you have to, you've got to reverse that, get rid of the inflammation, and then your, then your arteries and all the organs can be helped. No, that's the key is that high carbohydrate diet, insulin resistance makes the body inflamed, and that causes a range of diseases, including cancer, which we, we haven't mentioned yet. Thank you so much, Professor Knox. Last questions from subscribers. What is the best type of exercise to do for an average man to stay healthy? Yeah, you know, I used to think it was running and cycling and swimming, and I don't think so anymore. I think that you need to do a bit of both. You need to do your aerobics, but you do need to get in the gym and lift weights. You've got to work the steel. <laughs> and, I, and I think the older you are, you need to do more of that and, and also high-intensity exercise. So my whole career in running was doing mainly low-intensity exercise until I got near a race. Then I'd do some higher intensity exercise. So in the past, I would have said, you know, do lots of aerobic exercise, but I now realize you do need to do some high intensity exercise. And so I do about an hour a week of very high intensity exercise and the benefits are enormous. So that's, that's why I think you've got to include some high intensity exercise and some weight training as well. Thank you so much, Professor Knox. And last question, would you like to issue a seven day challenge to our subscribers? Okay, so my seven-day challenge would be to first cut sugar from your diet. That's, that's the most difficult one. And so I would say stop adding sugar to your tea or coffee. I'm sorry, I know Indians don't drink much coffee, but mainly tea. Stop drinking a tea with sugar and stop drinking beverages, sugar-laden beverages. That would be my first challenge. And if seven days, at the end of seven days, you haven't had any sugar added to your tea or It's, you've drunk no sweet drinks, then you can move to the next phase, which would be to look at the foods you're eating and see how much sugar they contain. And you'll be absolutely astonished at how much sugar is present in highly refined industrial diets. Thank you so much, Professor Knox, uh, for helping us to become healthy and answering all of our questions. Thank you so much. It's my great privilege. It's been a wonderful interview. Thank you so much. I've I just loved your enthusiasm and I know you're going to make a massive difference to the Indian population and get them healthy and get away, get rid of the metabolic disease and get rid of the diabetes. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, Professor, you are like super awesome. I really like you. I hope we can meet one day. <laughs> Indeed. I hope so too. So thanks again for a wonderful hour or so. It's been so in engaging. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank made you so my day. Much. You made, made our day. life. So you're awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. You're awesome. Yes. You're awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Bye. Yeah. So my advice to everyone living in India, if they want to be really healthy, they should please subscribe to the BNS Goku Great channel and learn all about the fabulous diets that will make them very healthy.